Hello dear viewers and listeners, uh, we offer you a series of presentations uh, dedicated to disclosure of uh, falsifications that for various reasons have acquired the status of uh, historical materials and thus have already caused and continue to cause serious damage to historical schools and historical uh, science of various countries and the nations on a global scale. One of the most uh, notable places in this regard is occupied by the work Patmutun Hayot's Heis, uh, History of Heis by Moses uh, Horinatsi, which is quite well known to historic historians around the world. In the English-speaking world, it is known as the History of Armenians by Moses of Horen. According to the statements uh, of the historical schools of modern Armenia, this work, consisting of three parts, uh, was written in the middle of the 5th century and is, according to Armenian historians, a very accurate, uh, reliable and uh, chronologically consistent description of not only the ancient history of Armenia in the original language, uh, Hayastan, but also the entire region of Asia Minor and the Near East, the Middle East and the South Caucasus. For this reason, Moses Harinatsi or Moses of Haren is traditionally called an outstanding historian, uh, the father of Armenian history, and often even an Armenian Herodotus. And the work Patmutun Hayat itself has become uh, a cornerstone in the foundation of the historical school of Hayastan or uh, Armenia. The national historiography of modern Armenia is built on the foundation of this work. These traditional opinions uh, were so widely advertised and spread that historians and researchers from various countries began to actively use uh, references to this work and its author in their writings, often without conducting a thorough analysis. Uh, could in fact what was written, uh, what was written about in the work of Moses of Horen, take place in real history? Does the content of Patmutun Hayot's uh, or Hayat's history or Armenian's history correspond to real historical events uh, that took place in the region? And how legitimate and acceptable is it to refer to this work as to a historical source? But with careful study of this text, you can find answers to these and other questions. First of all, it, uh, it should be noted that this work uh, first appeared in one of the printing houses of the city of Amsterdam in 1695, immediately in the form of a complete work consisting of three books. Uh, this is despite the fact that from the declared the middle of the 5th century to the end of the 17th century, it means uh, during 12 centuries, 1200 years, there were no authentic manuscripts of Moses of Horen observed, nor at least a copy of his work left by any other writer. But this did not prevent the sudden appearance of a big com completed work consisting of uh, three large parts in 1695 uh, from a printing house owned by Armenian priests in Amsterdam. The identity of the author of Patmos and Hayats also remains a big question to this day, since there is every reason to believe that neither the author nor his work could have existed in the middle of the 5th century. The name of the writer is a pseudonym and it arose at the end of the second half of the 17th century when the whole uh, writing was composed. But let's return to the analysis of the work of uh, Moses of Horen. The first book of Patmut and Hayats or History of Hayats is called uh, The Genealogy of the Great Country of Hayats, Hayats Methods in the original language. The analysis of the content of the first book consisting of 32 chapters uh, and devoted to the archaic origins of the ancient history of the high people already provides sufficient grounds uh, for asserting the complete insolvency of the entire writing as a historical work. A characteristic and specific feature of this work is uh, that the Parthians, uh, the rulers of the Parthian state, descended from the Parthian royal dynasty of the Arsakids are called highs and high kings, and the territories in which they reigned uh, are called country of Hais and Hayastan. From chapter 8 of the first book, the author proceeds to invent the main element of his narrative, the starting legend, on the basis of which all the subsequent content of the writing is built. But the paradox of this work lies in the fact that this very chapter, which is key for the whole, work, whole book, is a falsification with uh, such a great potential for self-destruction that it actually destroys uh, the entire work. Realizing that in order to complete a history one should use some written sources, the author decides to invent a legend about once existent written works supposedly 
uh, supposedly giving uh, the right to invent history, but in the end composes a completely unacceptable fairy tale. But before we refer directly to the text of the writing, a note must be made that these analyses have been made on the basis of translations of Moses of Horan into English by a professor of Armenian studies at Oxford University, Robert Thompson, who translated into English several classical Armenian, Syriac and Greek texts. His translations of the text of the history of Armenians from Armenian into English are considered the best and uh, generally accepted for all English publications. So, the clause uh, 8 uh, of the first book named uh, Who Found Such Tales and Where? And it, and it says uh, that Arshak the Great, King of Persia and Parthia, having abandoned the Macedonians, uh, reigned over the whole eastern Assyria, and having killed the king Antiochus in Nineveh, subjugated the entire universe to his power. He makes his, uh, can, he makes his uh, brother Valarshak king in Armenia, highest country in original language, considering it favorable for preserving the inviolability of his reign. He appoints Mitzvin as a capital and includes within his state's borders a part of western Syria, Palestine, Asia, and of Middle Earth and Titalia, starting from the Pont the Pontic Sea to the place where the Caucasus ends at the Western Sea, as well as Atarpatakan and so on. What your thought and courage will achieve for the borders of the brave, says he, determines their sword. How much he cuts off, so much they own. This key chapter for the whole work is completely anti-historical. And its anti-historicity is connected with the fact that by the name Ashak the Great, the king of Persia and Parthia, is meant the ruler of Parthian state uh, Shahin Shah Arsak V, Semitridates I, from the great Parthian dynasty of Arsakids, years of his rule 171 to 138 BC. And King Antiochus is the ruler of Syria, the Greek King Antiochus VII Sidet, from the Greek uh, Seleucid dynasty, years and, uh, of his rule um, 138 to 129 BC. The ruler of Parthia, Arsakis V or Mitridates I, really became famous for laying the foundation of Parthian power and thanks to his conquest the, uh, the Parthian states uh, increased significantly, but it could not fight with Antiochus Sidetes and kill him in Nineveh, simply because Nineveh, the former capital of Assyria, was destroyed in uh, the 7th century BC, 400 years before the birth of both Mitridates I and uh, Antiochus VII. In fact, Antiochus Sidetes died in battle with Parthians in 129 BC. But the dominant and truly monstrous fiction contained in this chapter is the description of those colossal lands and territories that uh, the said Arsak V uh, or Mitridates I allegedly handed over to his brother named Valarshak in 2nd century BC. Note that Arsak V did not have such brother in real history. Valarshak is a name invented by the falsifier. According to the text, uh, these lands are Persia and Parthia, the whole East and Assyria, Syria, Palestine, Asia, the whole Middle Earth, meaning entire peninsula of Asia Minor, Tetalia, starting from the Pontic Sea to the place where Caucasus ends uh, at the Western Sea, meaning Caspian Sea, it is Western if uh, viewed from the side of the ancestral Parthia in the East, as well as Atarpatakan, meaning entire region of the Northern and Southern Azerbaijan. Of course, this never happened in the history and could not happen ever in real history. And at the same time, the ruler of Parthia, the Parthian Arsak V and his brother Valarshak, who appeared in the text but never existed in real history, are called High Kings, and the author of the work calls uh, this enormous territory, which uh, the ancient Greeks used to call Oikumena, the country of high and high lands. But this key chapter has a continuation uh, which uh, further aggravates the severity of the distortions of history committed in it. It further states that this Valarshak wanted to find out who exactly and which men owned the highest country before him, whether to valiant or incompetent belong, belonged in the past to the place uh, that he would occupy. And having found a certain Syrian Marabas Katina, a man of sharp mind and an expert in Chaldean and Greek letters, he sends him to his brother Ar Arshak the Great with worthy gifts asking to open the royal archives for him. And then comes in chapter 8 uh, which says, having received uh, this letter from the hands of Marabas Katina, 
Arshak the Great with great readiness orders to show him the archive that is in Nineveh rejoicing at the same time that his brother, to whom he entrusted half of his kingdom, has, has such thoughts. And he, after reviewing all the books, found one written in the Hellenic language with the title, as it says, This book was translated by order of Alexander, meaning Alexander the Great, from Chaldean into Greek and contains uh, the true history of the ancients and ancestors. It follows from what has been written that the ruler of Parthia, Arsakis V or Mithridates I, somewhere in the middle of the 2nd century BC, was in the city of Nineveh, the former capital of ancient Assyria, where the famous archives of the Assyrian kings were kept. But this is an absolutely unacceptable fantasy, since Nineveh was destroyed and burned in the 7th century BC, 400 years before the birth of the Parthian Mithridates I, its ruins were already underground. But that's not all. The author says uh, that a certain literate Syrian named Marabaskatina was found and sent uh, to Nineveh to search for information about ancient history in the archives under the ruins of the ancient capital of Assyria. And here attention is attracted by the word Mar in the name of the Syrian because this word was first used by Syrians in Christian times uh, in the names of uh, Christian priests and it means Lord. And by this, without realizing the forgery being committed, the author aggravates uh, the already unacceptable fiction with uh, the archives of Nineveh by the fact that two centuries before the birth of Christ, and uh, the beginning of Christianity, a certain Syrian Christian appears in his fantasies plunging under the ruins of uh, Nineveh in search of an archive. This absurd picture is completely disconnected from history and it exists exclusively in the imagination of the forger who created it. It has nothing to do with uh, real history and with the past of the region, but since in, uh, it, it is this uh, absurd fiction that acts as a key element in the construction of the national historiography of Hayastan or Armenia, the destructive potential of this falsification grows to catastrophic proportions. A specific feature of the work of Moses of Huron also lies in uh, the multi-layered nature of the invented absurdity. And in, the, and in the above passage, uh, there is another incredible fact that uh, practically destroys the entire work and completely deprives it of, of the right to be even remotely called a source of history. We are talking about mentioning the name of Alexander the Great. According to the text, a Syrian Christian cast into the past for two centuries before the Christian area, plunged underground into the ruins of Nineveh and pulled out a book uh, written in the Hellenic language. The title of the book read, uh, this book was translated by order of Alexander from uh, Chaldean into Greek and contains uh, the true history of the ancients and ancestors. In other words, it turns out that Alexander the Great was born in 356 BC, 300 years before his uh, birth, found himself in Nineveh when it was not yet destroyed and burned, and ordered the Chaldean manuscripts to be translated into the Hellenic language there. And after that, the book in Greek was left in the archives of the Assyrian kings, so that it would remain under the ruins of the city in order to be discovered 400 years later, two centuries before the birth of Christ and beginning of Christianity by a Syrian Christian named Marabas. These gross distortions of history, revealed in just two chapters of the history of Hais by Moses of Horan in the form of multi-layered absurdity, are not just an accidental slip of the writer. It is a deliberate and purposeful forgery that turns the entire narrative into an unacceptable falsification. These facts alone are enough to reject the work of Moses of Horan as a crude anti-historical forgery completely unsuitable for using it as a historical source. And that's it for today. Subscribe to our channel and don't forget to like it because there are still many interesting conversations ahead. See you again. Have a nice day.